But now, let's look at ourselves. <laughs> On the face of it, we seem to be very different. We do waste our time. We do indulge in hedonistic pleasures and recreations which may even be risky and have no obvious connection with individual or gene survival. We appear to be a serious exception to the Darwinian law. It just doesn't seem to be true that we spend our time working energetically for our genes. We are, of course, concerned with survival, concerned with our children, but we don't always work hard to get children, as naive Darwinism should predict. And naive Darwinism has no explanation for the widespread practice of contraception. Or worse, from the literal-minded Darwinian point of view, many people adopt the children of others. In nature, any genetically inherited urge to adopt and rear unrelated offspring would rapidly disappear from the population, ruthlessly weeded out by Darwinian selection. In nature, the only way to persuade another animal to look after your child is to deceive it elaborately into thinking it's their own. And that's, of course, how cuckoos make their genetic living. Yet in some human civilizations, the desire to adopt is so strong that the mother of an unwanted baby can sell it for money. I don't, for a moment, wish to knock adoption, by the way. I'm delighted that people do adopt. I'm sure there are many people here who have been adopted or who have adopted. I think it's a wonderful, unique feature of the human species. But it's not very Darwinian. There is an ambiguity in the way we use the language of purpose. When we say something like, the purpose of an aeroplane's tail is to stabilize it, we're saying something about the intention of the designer. But a bird's tail does much the same thing. If a bird didn't have a tail, it would pitch and roll like an aeroplane without a tail. So it's natural to use the same kind of language. The purpose of a bird's tail is to stabilize it. The purpose of a hedgehog's spines is to protect it. The purpose of a rabbit's fur is to keep it warm, and, and so on. But of course, everything about animals and plants that looks as if it's been designed for a purpose has in fact been shaped by the slow sculpting of natural selection. And I'm calling this kind of pseudo-purposiveness archaeopurpose. It's the ancient kind of purpose before the human kind of purpose or the nervous system kind of purpose evolved. It resembles deliberate intentional purpose, but it is not. There is no intention there. The archaeo purpose of a bird's wing is to aid flight. And you see there four beautiful flying machines, which in their different ways would excite the admiration of any aerodynamic engineer who might have designed these things. These are man-made flying machines with a neo-purpose. The neo-purpose of a wing in a plane is to aid flight. Neo-purpose, as opposed to archaeo-purpose, is the kind of purpose we are all familiar with from our own designs and schemes and goals. And my thesis tonight is that neo-purpose is itself an evolved adaptation with a survival value or archaeo purpose, in the same sense as a feather, an eye, a tail, or a backbone has an archaeo purpose. Brains have evolved with various capacities that assist the survival of the genes that made them. Among these evolved capacities is the ability to set up goals or purposes, and the ability to design machines and other artifacts that resemble naturally evolved organs like tails, wings, eyes, and hearts. And, of course, artifacts that resemble brains themselves, computers. The brain is a kind of onboard computer used to control the body's behavior in ways that are beneficial to the genes that built it. It perceives the outside world, it remembers things, it learns the consequences of its actions, good and bad, it sets up simulated models in imagination, and Here's the point of my argument today. It sets up purposes or goals in the sense of neo-purpose. The capacity to have a mental goal or neo-purpose is an adaptation with a survival value or archaeo-purpose. Do 
man-made electronic machines have a kind of neo-purpose over and above the purpose of the designer who made them. Yes, they do. Guided missiles track a moving target like a plane. The missile is controlled by its own onboard computer, which detects the position of the target by some kind of sense organ, maybe a heat sensor, maybe it uses radar. The discrepancy between the present position of the target and the missile is measured, and the motors and steering surfaces of the missile are controlled and manipulated to reduce the discrepancy between the target and the missile intercept. And if the target plane takes evasive action, twisting and turning, then a good missile automatically takes countermeasures. It shows flexible, versatile behavior to close the gap between itself and the target. It behaves, the missile behaves, as if its computer contains a mental picture of its goal, a neo-purpose. Cannonballs didn't have that property. They were simply lobbed in the general direction of the target. Once on their way, they didn't change direction. They just went ballistically. Um, the cannons, of course, were designed by humans with a purpose in mind, but the cannonball itself is just a lump of iron. It doesn't have the, uh, the, the, the neo-purpose property that a guided missile does, and that a bat does. So a bat is a guided missile, it tracks targets such as insects, using in this case sonar, sound echoes. It uh, can home in on a moving target, a target that is taking evasive action in just the same sort of way as a guided missile. And so I would want to say that a bat has a neo-purpose, in the same sense at least as a guided missile does, but that the bat's neo-purpose also has an archaeopurpose, which was previously, quote, designed by natural selection of ancestral bats, working on ancestral bat genes. Even very simple living things uh, behave in some ways as though they have neo-purposes. Maggots move away from light. They're photophobic. And the way they do it is by swinging the head from side to side rhythmically, and comparing the light intensity on the left side with the right side. And if you have a light in the room, you switch on the room in the, the, a light in the room every time the maggot happens to be swinging to the left, and switch off the light every time it happens to be swinging to the right, then you can fool it into moving away from where it thinks the light is, which is the left in this, in this case. I use the word think somewhat ill-advisedly. Animals employ a range of increasingly sophisticated guidance systems, paralleling the techniques developed by human engineers. Dragonflies hunt rather like bats, hunt, hunt uh, flying insects, swooping and diving uh, on them. With all the flexibility of a man-made guided missile, they use their large eyes, their large compound eyes, to detect the position of the moving target and compute in the brain the necessary adjustments to the wings in order to home in on the target. And it's a sensible way to interpret their behavior, to say that their brain is set up as if it had a goal or neo-purpose. We're not saying they're conscious of it. They might be, but we don't know that. But they behave like a guided missile, as if they're programmed with a purpose, probably in much the same way as a guided missile. One of the most advanced things that any computer can do, and that includes the onboard computer in the skull, is simulation of the future. Computer programs playing chess have reached grandmaster standard, and this is largely done by simulating alternative futures. Whales, as you probably know, use sonar just like bats and just like submarines. I don't know, as, as I said, whether dragonflies are conscious, I suspect that bats may be, I'm almost sure that whales are, but that's not the question I'm raising tonight. They, all of them, are using some kind of goal-seeking machinery, some kind of neo-purpose, which has been put there by natural selection with an archaeo 